I sat on the back porch and watched the sun set over the western Catskills. The house, it could not be called a house, consisted of one large room and a fairly spacious porch. This room contained a small kitchen and stairs to the attic bedroom, and in the far corner there was a small bathroom with a shower. This part of the Catskills is largely undeveloped. There is no industry, farming is almost impossible, and there is nothing to mine. All tourist places are located in the south and east. This is a good place to go if you want to be alone and close to nature. I'm sent for your thoughts, she says. Save your money, I don't have any, I answer. This is Annette Malena Grafine von Kabroth. I met her in Montreux on Lake Geneva. She more or less hooked me up. I had lunch at one of the overpriced cafe restaurants that seemed to be all over Switzerland. Is this chair occupied? She asked. No, don't be shy. But she didn't take the chair to another table, as I expected. She sat up straight. To my puzzled look, she replied, I want to practice my English. How did you know that I speak English? Most Americans do, she said with the laugh that had become so familiar to me. This laughter suggests that all Americans are a little simple-minded and for this reason are very funny in their immaturity. This was the beginning. It wasn't hard for her to seduce me. Since we arrived in Catskills, she walked all the paths, swam in all the reservoirs, and found all kinds of entertainment that I did not even suspect. The locals love her. Why not? She loves spending my money, and she's beautiful. I wouldn't call her sexy. She is tall, 180 centimeters, and thin. She has a beautiful oval face, a head of blonde hair and clear blue eyes. She has a flat chest like a boy, a petite waist, and a cute little ass. Boy girls in Bangkok have more feminine curves than Annette, but her smile is to die for. I could easily love her if it weren't for her baggage. Annette is 30 years old, married, and has three children. All the children are girls and go to school. The Count, well, that's just a Count, usually goes on a business trip with one of his mistresses. Annette plays while he's away and is the author of many travel books, but she tells me it's all business when they're at home together. Apparently, a lot of effort goes into being a German aristocrat. It was a quasi-arranged marriage, although she tells me they love each other very much. After six weeks of living together, I realized that her idea of love and mine had little in common. You left your wife after 19 years of marriage because she only took one lover? She asked, shocked by my shocking behavior. I didn't love her? She burst out laughing. You've been married too long to use that excuse. It's not just that. You're mostly lying to yourself. Your anger is not enough to cover the pain you have caused. It's hard to lose your husband, father, and son. There must be more reasons than you say. I wasn't going to let them walk over me. Nonsense. This could lead to separation or divorce, perhaps. But completely breaking up with your entire family over a little sex? No, I think you're one of those hopeless romantics. You are looking for something that you will never find, because it only exists in films and books. In real life, we take what we can get and are grateful. How can I live with what she did? I asked. She laughed her annoying laugh. Because you cannot live without her, as well as without other women from whom you are also running. You can't even look them in the face, so you hide. You are afraid that you will return to them, because without them, you have no life. Unfortunately, she's right, at least emotionally. I led a lonely and aimless existence until Annette came along. It's amazing what things you miss. By the way, your daughter laughs. The kiss your wife gives you in the morning. Calling your mom once a week with all the family news. Knowing that she calls only to find out how you are doing. It's all a trap. Give in to them, and they will bind you so tightly that you will never be able to free yourself. Annette said it right. I didn't leave. I ran away. I can't go back because I might never want to leave again. I'm here with you. This is my life, I said. I'm on vacation now. Soon I will return to life. My real life, and you will be nothing more than a pleasant memory, she said, stroking my face with her hand. I think that tells me what kind of relationship we have. 
Stop being a spoiled brat. Go back to your wife. You punished her enough for her little sin. We saw everything so differently. I couldn't blame her. We were from different worlds. Strangely, I knew my mother would agree with her, but I had to keep searching. Even if I didn't find what I was looking for, I promised myself I'd have a good time. Last New Year, I left my wife and family. I spent the first few months traveling around the Far East. I traveled through all of Asia and ended up in Europe, more precisely in Switzerland. During this time, I never suffered from female communication, but each of them wanted something. Annette was different. Oh, she wanted something, but it was just a good time. She managed to dole the pain in my chest. It's hard to be alone, and it's hard to get rid of feelings that have accumulated throughout your life. You don't choose your family, but you love them anyway. It's nice to watch the sunset. I'm glad I came. The Swiss were so uptight, she said, sitting on my lap. Is our relationship bad? Did it hurt my husband or your wife? And if so, don't they both deserve it? I have no answer. She is right. How rich are you? I think very much, she said. Does it matter? Yes, it has. You are very rich, like my grandfather. He too hid his wealth, but then, like you, my grandfather earned it through ill-gotten means. Trading Western goods on the black market in East Germany with my father, she said. Do you think I'm a fraud? I asked. Well, of course, and smart, because you weren't caught. Doesn't that bother you? I am a woman who married a man because her father needed the respectability that her husband's title provided. How can I criticize you? And yet you say that you love your husband. Why not? He may have married me for grandpa's money, but it was a deal we both made. And what about love? How stupid you are. Love comes later, when you struggle together, sacrifice for each other, give birth to children, and raise them together. You are here with me, and he is somewhere else, with another woman. She shrugged. Sometimes you need to feel the romance with stupid an American who is lost and alone because he believes in fairy tales. At that moment, my mobile phone rang. It was the contractor for the building at 27 Division Street, Chamonix. I looked around here. It's a complete mess, he said. So clean up and fix what's broken, just like we agreed, I said. But nothing is standard and nothing makes sense. All these hidden spaces and the underground exit to the carriage lane. What's the use of this room? It cannot be rented out, and only a fool would buy it. It's my business. I'm paying you to restore the building. I don't care if it doesn't have a modern purpose. It's not intended for that, I said, and hung up. My anger took over. Ignorance irritates me so much. What? I said as she gave me a knowing look. You're just like my grandfather, always chasing money. I like this building. My grandfather often walked me past it when we went for ice cream. He had an interesting story about him, I said. He had a story, and now you have a scheme. It's always like this with people like you. You never play fair, you always cheat, she said. Elizabeth Parker looked like the complete opposite of her boss, State Senator Maria Consuela Ruiz. The first-term Bronx Democrat was a short, plump woman with dark brown skin reflecting her Hispanic and African heritage. Maria wore short black hair and long dresses, as befits 47-year-old, a respectable Catholic, mother of three children, 27-year-old Liz Parker, with a height of 180 centimeters, towered over her boss. The young woman was white. Anglo-Saxon Protestant. On the surface, they were an unlikely team. But according to political bosses, they went together like white rice and beans. Their bodies and backgrounds were different, but they shared common beliefs. As a team, they were one strike for two. Maria was not a beautiful woman by any standards, but she had a personality that could win over the coldest fish and a talent for saying things that others never got away with. For some reason, from Maria's lips, the most cruel insult sounded almost like a compliment. Liz was the complete opposite. She irritated people, especially men, but she had good looks that couldn't be denied. She could easily gain another five kilograms and still be considered slim. Maria could lose 15 and still be plump. These women were burning with ambition, and their life experiences complemented each other. 
Maria grew up in a political club in the Bronx, the daughter of a captain father and a female leader of a democratic club. At 22, she married, straight out of City College, Salvatore Ruiz, a 40-year-old accomplished businessman. Then she was counting on a quiet life. She gave birth to two children before becoming convinced that Sully, as he was called, could never avoid cheating. His infidelity only increased throughout their marriage. Her third pregnancy was an accident, the result of their family's insistence that he be given another chance. Divorced at 30 and technically excommunicated from her church, she was forced to somehow organize her new life. Sally paid Maria alimony in addition to child support. With this money and a scholarship, she received a law degree from Columbia University. Her political resume describes her as a practicing lawyer, but she has never had a law office or paying clients. She worked in family court, as a guardian, and as an assigned attorney. And her election to the state senate was a fluke. It was believed that the former holder of this post was invincible. Maria's main task was only to formally help her achieve appointment as a family court judge. If you don't give me the nod, I'll hold an expensive, time-consuming primary, preliminary voting, election of a single candidate from a political party. Who could have known at the time that a federal prosecutor had already prepared a grand jury indictment against a sitting judge, and the case was a win-win? Therefore, there were no primaries. She had no opponent then, and no opponent in the general election. Maria came to Albany, a shrewd and capable politician in need of the skills needed to be a good legislator. Liz, on the other hand, served in the state Senate as assistant majority whip throughout her years at Russell Sage College. While attending law school, she continued to work full-time. After graduating, she made one wrong move when she took a job in the state attorney by general's office. She left after six months to work for a senior Republican lawmaker. Liz met Maria by chance in the legislative cafeteria. They literally ran into each other. When they had cleared their salad plates, Maria invited the young woman to have dinner with her. Forty-five minutes later, a coalition was born. Liz became senior aide to Senator Ruiz. What do you have for me? Maria asked Liz. Well, David P. Landon Jr., Liz answered. And who is he? I think he's the key to Stuyvesant Leltide, Liz said, grinning like the cat that swallowed the canary. Maria had to smile despite herself. When she grew up in the Bronx, the area was largely a slum. A man named Robert Moses used a tool known as the eminent domain to cut the Bronx into pieces between state highways. Entire areas were destroyed. Those that remained were separated by roads without crossing. Shops were on one side and houses were on the other side of the roads with limited access. What had once been a series of middle-class neighborhoods overnight became New York's worst slum. When Maria was still a student at City College, a professor advised her to read Robert Caro's biography of Moses, entitled The Power Broker. If Maria could accomplish one thing as a legislator, it would be to reform eminent domain practices in the state. In her first weeks on the job, she came across a rumor about a company called Stuyvesant that was somehow gaming the system. It had all the hallmarks of a scandal, which in turn might spark real reform. Liz passed Landon's file to Maria across the table. He's 46, married for 20 years, father of twin daughters, both at Wesley, Liz said. A bit expensive. The wife comes from money. He appears to have a small, eminent domain practice in a small firm. But in cases where Stuyvesant Limited took advantage of foreclosures, he was the lead attorney for the landowners in at least 90% of the cases. Could this be a coincidence? asked Maria. More like a coincidence, and if you look at all the Stuyvesant purchase and sale agreements, you will see that not a single lawyer representing Stuyvesant ever appears. All signatures are provided by a Wyoming agent. How could they act without a New York lawyer? So we think Lawyer Landon is connected to Stuyvesant? They somehow get advance notice and then buy nearby properties. While the proceedings drag on, Landon is aware of everything that is happening. They can't lose. You think this Landon guy will talk? Asked Maria. Why not? 
He's a lawyer. If we call him before the committee, he knows that we will give him immunity. Then he will be forced to speak or go to jail. He will gain nothing by shielding his accomplices. But he might have problems with the United States Attorney, Maria said. That means he will serve several years in a maximum security prison in the Federal Club. He deserved it. Doris Landon hugged her lover. Mark was a tall, well-built man. As a lover, Mark was aggressive and dominant. Overall, Doris found him a very satisfactory lover, and their affair was very stimulating. If only her husband, David, had been more understanding. Things had gone wrong with David since he left her on New Year's Day, about eight months ago. Obviously, he found out about the betrayal, and despite the fact that all family members tried to assure him that there was nothing wrong with it, he left in an unknown direction. Doris was terribly worried. She loved this big idiot. He was the man she married and planned to spend the rest of her life with. All she wanted from Mark was a little romance, harmless fun, and those feelings you get when you're young and in love. David should have realized this, but of course he didn't. To put it bluntly, David was boring, always was, and always will be. He was a lawyer, for God's sake, and as if that wasn't bad enough, all he did was get convictions. Doris had no idea what he was doing, but she knew it was very boring. Mark was interesting and different from others. He was everything she gave up a good home and family for. She, of course, did not love him, and I didn't believe that I would ever be able to. It was an interlude, like those British movies where the wife meets a handsome guy at the train station, they have a whirlwind romance, and then she returns home to her boring-as-mud husband. But in the movies, the husband understands. After all, they are together, husband and wife. David was gone, and frankly, she didn't trust him to take care of himself. He left his legal practice. He didn't take any money, just clothes and his old beat-up, Honda Civic. She was worried. David has never been independent. Doris married him while they were at school together, and in the early years, she supplemented his income with money from her family. David never made much money. In his best year, he earned $90,000. The same year, she earned $130,000, plus benefits as a full professor. She had their health insurance. On his own, David couldn't even afford to get sick. Where was he and what was he doing? She was filled with guilt and anxiety. Everyone in the family said he would return. He would cool down and come back. After all, what else could he do? As his own mother said, he had no life outside of his family. He loved his daughter so much and now he wouldn't talk to them because they took their mother's side. Her mother was right when she said that Doris waited too long to take a lover. David would never have left her if the girls still needed him. When the girls were in college, he could leave. He was one of those people who always put his fatherly duty first. He must come back and be a good husband. But eight months passed without a word. You're thinking about him again, Mark said, hugging her. Sorry, I can't help it. I guess I've been married too long, she said, turning to her lover for a kiss. Usually the wife worries about what her husband finds out and not about the man himself. This is a bit of a blow to my ego. How many married women were with you, mister? She asked with mocking indignation. With several. A woman usually doesn't lie next to you, worrying about her missing husband. Mark didn't say that part of his pleasure was the knowledge that he was cuckolding his husband. He took her husband's woman and the husband could not do anything about it. David killed some of the fun. The guy just walked out and disappeared. Mark had never met him, but realized that this man was under the control of his rich wife. David may not have been cooperative, but Doris was still wonderful, and even though she was only the assistant department he'd now, everyone knew that she was going to fill in for the department chair during the upcoming Christmas break. He was due to resign at the end of the year, this would be a good idea for an out-of-work assistant professor who was dating the new professor. Sorry, said Doris. Liz was confused. Everything seemed so simple. Bring this middle-aged family man to the committee and offer him immunity in exchange for his testimony. Simple and without risk on their part. If he refuses to speak, he will be held for contempt of court, and this will be good advertising for the senator. 
If he lies, he will be prosecuted. Again, good publicity for the senator. But if he tells the truth, they'll get the scandal they want, and the senator will have a hot topic to ride on. The problem was that David Landon wasn't there. She started looking in the obvious place, his work, but he simply called on January 2nd and said that he was quitting. No one has seen him since he quit, and what's even more alarming is that all of his work was completed before he left. No one noticed, but apparently he had been planning to leave for some time. How to find a person who has decided to leave. Labor Day, Picnic at the Bank Chaumont was a large celebration held not on Labor Day, but the week before. Employees, relatives, and friends gathered for a picnic at the Lamplighter for a big day of food and entertainment, more than 500 people in all. The Chamon family were the hosts, like medieval princes giving a feast to the serfs. Liz received the invitation without any problems. Many politicians gladly accept invitations. She was just one of the crowd of supplicants at the family table Chamon. The Chamonts included the Boswells, the Landons, and several other branches of the extended family. Liz decided that the picnic would be a good place to find out what happened to David Landon. His daughters were there, of course. The Landon girls were hard to miss in crop tops and Daisy Duke shorts. They were two sexy-looking women. They seemed to enjoy male attention, but they were also two responsible young women. They organized all the children and led all the games showing an energy and dedication that was exhausting to watch. Parents could relax and have fun because the Landon girls took care of the children. Of course, many young men were happy to help. Liz laughed at the young and not-so-young men who prostrated themselves to help look after the babies and gawked at the Landon twins in skimpy outfits. Liz wandered around the area and tried to greet as many people as possible, gently asking about David Landon. The official version was that he went on a business trip, but no one knew where exactly. There were rumors that he was having a midlife crisis and his family sent him to treatment. Eventually, she approached a group of tables where the inner circle was clearly Shamontov, a tall, fair-haired man, quite handsome, if a little heavyset, was in charge of the barbecue team. As she approached, he looked back to smile and wave at the attractive young woman who was holding her own team among what could have been a group of suitors. Liz had already identified most of the Landons and Boswells by questioning them. The blonde man was Lawrence Boswell Jr., and the woman was his wife, Anne. As Liz learned, she had a certain reputation. Boswell seemed to be enjoying himself and was oblivious to the obvious flirting his wife was doing. Excuse me, are you Lawrence Boswell? Liz asked, walking up to Larry. Yes, but everyone calls me Larry. Lawrence is my father, Larry replied. I wanted to meet you. I'm Elizabeth Parker, assistant to the state senator. Ruiz? Yes, I know. I saw you at the Senate hearing on downtown redevelopment. This project is very close to my father's heart. I think he sees it as his legacy to the region, Larry said. Liz was familiar with the proposed project, a major redevelopment of city center in the old commercial district Chaumont. Many shops and houses will be relocated as a result of the eminent domain. There were rumors in the Capitol building that this was a done deal, but it divided father and son. Larry Jr. was against the project, believing it would displace too many small businesses and families. For this, he was considered a kind of weak sister. By mentioning the project, Larry gave Liz the opportunity she needed. Well, I assume you've been consulting with your brother-in-law, David Landon, about acquiring the land, Liz said, waiting for an answer. Larry frowned. Dave is unavailable now and took a short vacation. Liz is tired of this generic version. Look, to put it bluntly, the senator believes that using eminent domain to move so many homes and businesses has significant drawbacks. She would like to call expert witnesses to discuss these issues. Due to this... We attempted to contact Landon, but he appears to have disappeared. Could you tell me how to contact him? Larry looked very awkward, but before he could speak, a woman with a stunning appearance butted into the conversation. My husband left me. Thank you, Larry. But the time for hiding the truth must come to an end. We don't know where he is or if he's even alive, said the woman, who Liz now knew was named Doris Landon. 
Doris looked like a woman in deep mourning, and Liz's heart sank. Sorry, Mrs. Landon, I didn't want to pry into your personal affairs, but we wanted to consult with your husband. Forgive me and let me say that I understand where your daughters get such attractive looks. Liz started to walk away, but Doris grabbed her hand. Please, if you find my husband, tell him, tell him, I ask him to come home. Liz felt like a fool, realizing that these people had no idea that the man they saw as a loving husband and father was actually a criminal. How could a person do this to his family and why? These people had money. He didn't need to steal. She couldn't help but think that David Landon was a heartless man. Annette returned home to live a middle-class life and write her latest travel book. Rupert von Kabruth was at home after his latest business trip. As usual, things didn't go as well as his father-in-law wanted. He was a disappointment for this old rascal. However, something has changed. This time, the old man was softer, or as soft as a man who had been taken and tortured by the Stasi as a young man could be. One had to respect that he never spoke about it and that, according to legend, he never named a single name. Count Rupert knew he was not in this league. It took more than just courage to play in it. This required the nerves of steel and the brains of a criminal from Cracker Jack. Rupert knew that he would never achieve what the old man expected, not alone. He felt that something was wrong with his wife. He cared about Annette. They were distant relatives and it was an arranged marriage, but he wouldn't have married her if he didn't like her. And he believed that her affection for him was sincere and deep. What is the problem? You haven't been yourself since you came back from America, he said, looking at her across the kitchen table. Nothing special, except that you've ever wondered what it would be like to find love? I mean, like in novels. Rupert studiously refused to laugh. I think you let your Native American self get to you, he said. They did not hide their romances from each other. They hid them from prying eyes. But when they married, they promised each other to be honest and remain friends no matter what. Rupert was a real aristocrat, but the title did not bring money. Annette's grandfather had money, but her father was an unnamed East German. It was not a love couple, but rather similar. So far, they had kept their promises to each other, but Rupert hated that she slept with other men. It was selfish, he knew, because he loved women and wasn't going to limit himself to just one. But he always felt that Annette was special. Rupert considered her the best of women, or even the only one of her kind. This American was completely different. Obviously, he penetrated where the previous ones did not penetrate. He made you think, didn't he? Not so much to think as to feel as if there could be something more, she said. This is an exceptional place. How did you find it? Sheila Morgan told Liz Parker. They had lunch at a cafe Ilium in Troy. It was a nice casual place with an extensive breakfast menu. Trivia that locals know, Liz said. It was Labor Day weekend. The senator went home to the Bronx to, as they say, tighten her flesh. Liz was off duty when she ran into her old school friend Sheila, who was touring the college with her daughter Paula. Mother and daughter visited several schools while driving through the Hudson Valley. In Troy, they toured Liz's alma mater, Russell Sage, an all-girls university, and Rensselaer Polytech, a large, wealthy institution. Paula was only a sophomore, but the trend was that searching and planning had to start early. I still can't believe how much you've grown, Liz told Paula. Maybe you can convince my mom, like a big girl, that I don't need an escort every minute. That's why you need a mother to look after you, Sheila said and hugged her daughter affectionately. Oh, look, isn't this the same English professor who gave a talk yesterday? Paula said. Liz sat with her back to the door, but now she turned and saw Doris Landon come in with a tall, handsome black man. He put his arm around her waist, and when they sat down at a corner table, they quietly kissed. Yes, I think so. But what is her name? Sheila asked. Doris Langdon... Mrs. And this is not her husband, Liz said, unable to contain the disapproval in her voice. Don't judge, Elizabeth. We can't know all the facts. You need to get over Edward, Sheila said. Who is Edward? asked Paula. Just a regular snake that wears pants, Liz replied. 
Sheila laughed and told her daughter that she was too young to hear the story. It wasn't really that big of a story, but it hurt like hell, that's for sure, even all these years later. Edward Ryan was the best-looking guy in his graduating class at SUNY Albany. They were getting married. That was until one afternoon, like any bad story, she returned to the apartment they shared and found Ed in his bed with another woman. From there, the story only got worse. She ran out of the house in tears. With nowhere to go, she ran to her friend Sheila. Sheila, her husband, and two children had a house the size of a matchbox in Kingston. They were a good ten years older than Liz. He was a teacher, as was Sheila, until she decided to go back to school and get a law degree. They lived modestly, but they had a sofa on which she could sleep. Two weeks passed, and she decided that she had to forgive Edward. He made a mistake. She called him and asked him to meet at a small gloomy bar called The Elbow, not far from the law school. Edward looked remorseful when he arrived, but when she tried to make amends, I have something. Oh, this is difficult, he said. What? Well, this is how it is. I fell in love. You bastard. Are you breaking off our engagement? I think yes. You either know or you don't. Please don't be angry. I can't help my feelings. I assume you want the ring back. Well, here, take this, she said, throwing him a small diamond ring. I'll come by at the weekend to pick up my things. Don't worry. Nancy and I are leaving for California next week. What about training? I'm leaving. This is no longer what I want. I co-signed your student loans. If you drop out, they will be due. How are you going to pay them? No way. We are going to live without a livelihood. Nancy says you won't know what life is until you go back to the basics. Listen, idiot. If you don't, you will pay these loans. They will look for me. I cannot help you. It's time for me to go, he said and left her. After this, legal studies became a complete struggle. She ended up deeply in debt, even though she worked full-time throughout her studies. She was still trying to get out, but she had learned her lesson. Most men are bitches. It sounds like a very hot relationship, Sheila said, referring to Mrs. Landon and her lover. I wonder how long this has been going on, Liz said. I would guess that it was a long time ago. They don't act like it's something new. Her husband left her, Liz said. Well, it looks like they replaced him, Sheila said. But she says she wants her husband back. It may well be. I don't see this relationship working, Sheila reflected. Maybe she wants both, Paula grinned. Be careful, young lady. All you're doing is pushing me towards an all-girls university, Sheila said. But it was clear she was serious. Ultimately, Liz may have to reconsider the whole David Landon thing. Agnes Landon was at the end of a hard day. As the medical center's chief nurse, her job became largely administrative. But in these times of tight budgets and endless bureaucracy, her job wasn't easy. However, she was troubled by anxiety and anger at her son, David Landon Jr. She has always been very close to her son. He was always the best of the boys. Honest, loyal, and loving are just some of his positive qualities. He also had his bad sides. He was stubborn and a little lazy. But what bothered his mother most of all was the almost profound sadness he showed. As a child, he was very quiet for days on end and did not smile. A good day for her was one when she could make him smile and maybe hear him laugh. Such days were very rare and very far from each other. Doris Boswell was a dream come true. She had brains, looks, and money. More importantly, she was the type of person who always smiled and tried to make everyone else smile too. When he was with Doris, his mother knew that David Jr. was happy too. The icing on the cake was that Doris's mother was Margaret Boswell, who was Agnes's best friend. As children, Angie and Meg made a sacred vow to be friends forever. Both families were delighted that the children had found each other. However, Agnes always knew that it was Doris who married David. He was a passive man, but a bit of a romantic, a stubborn, impractical dreamer who could throw away his life in search of something that would never be found 
in this life. Agnes knew her son and where he got his stupid ideas about what life should be like. In her youth, she was also a romantic. She married David Sr. while a nursing student. Her friend Meg married Larry Boswell a year later. David and Larry met Angie and Meg on a double date arranged by friends. They wooed a rich girl from Chaumont, Meg, to an equally wealthy guy from Boswell, Larry. Both girls believed in love at first sight, and their romantic beliefs lasted only a few years until marriage. The honeymoons ended when the women found out that their husbands were cheaters. Dave and Larry became good friends through the friendship of their wives. It is quite natural that they made several joint men's trips. When Meg came to Agnes with evidence that the only fishing that had taken place was that of a female party, poor Angie was devastated. Meg was Chamon, and there was a lot of money and prestige at stake. Also, as a good Catholic, divorce was not an option one chose if it could be avoided. Angie's situation was much worse. She was never as sophisticated as Meg. Little David was one year old and had just found out she was pregnant again when Meg broke the news of David Sr.'s infidelity. From her own point of view, Angie had no choice but to stay in the marriage. Staying is what you did for the sake of the children. At that time, there was only little Dave, who became the center of his mother's life. After all, David Sr. was not a bad man. He was, most of the time, a loving husband and a good father. He was just a little mistaken. Angie would have survived it, but the romance died, replaced by bitterness and resentment. Dr. Superman Putra was tall for an Indonesian, had recently worked at the hospital, and appeared to be unattached. Like most doctors who flirt with nurses, he wasn't looking for a serious relationship, just having a little fun. Angie was working as a surgical nurse at the time, working hard to supplement the family budget and trying to cope with her husband's infidelity. Dr. Soup, as the nurses called him, was attentive and generous to the tall, blonde nurse with a very American figure. If things had been different at home, Angie would not have succumbed to his advances. But she needed help in the form of a man's shoulder to cry on. She needed to feel wanted. She needed to regain her self-respect. When everything worked out for the Landon and Boswell couples, an agreement was reached in which the spouses played within the limits of what was permitted. Over time, the situation changed, and wives began to play more than husbands. Perhaps women had more opportunities. It seemed that it was more acceptable for ladies to have discreet romantic relationships than for two married men to chase every skirt. Eventually, the decline of aging male libido caught up with the husbands. These were not the marriages that Agnes and Margaret dreamed of as children, but dreams are one thing, and reality is another. Agnes made a compromise so that the son she loved dearly would grow up in a good home and have a good life with a loving wife. Everything was fine until the holidays came last year. Doris was a young woman, only 38 years old. She was at that dangerous age when women begin to doubt their own attractiveness to the opposite sex. David was an adequate husband. As a father, he was caring and attentive. He clearly loved his daughters and was devoted to them. He helped and supported his wife in her career and, unlike most men, did not reproach the woman for her greater success. On the other hand, Agnes didn't kid herself that David wasn't boring. As a man, he was a lawyer, and that profession seemed to define him. He didn't drive cars, didn't play sports, and didn't collect anything. The worst part was that he seemed to become even darker as he grew older. It is not surprising that Doris sought entertainment outside of her marriage. She was a wonderful woman who took care of Davy. He wasn't the type to do it on his own, but Doris, on the other hand, was confident and independent. As she aged and matured, Doris's appearance seemed more and more attractive. She was one of those women who went from a beautiful girl to a beautiful woman. Is it any wonder that she found herself a younger and more handsome man? But this woman also had a head on her shoulders. She did not leave her husband, but was simply looking for an unnoticed affair. Why did David leave? He was a smart man. He should have known that he couldn't give up everything and survive. But Agnes knew that she could always count on her son's stubborn nature to overcome his common sense. When David left, she expected him to return within a few days, but that was eight, nine months ago. Where was he now? How does he live? 
The families agreed to leave him alone and let him cool down. Perhaps this was no longer the best strategy. Before leaving, he said hurtful things, mainly to his mother and wife. Perhaps if he knew that they had forgiven him, he would have returned? After all, he is a good son and a good husband, a father who is ready to give his life for his children. The good son had a pair of sevens in his hands. The game was Texas Hold'em, but it was played in a hotel room in Monte Carlo. The game was illegal and rigged. I was here out of boredom. After Annette returned to her family, I was feeling a little lonely and decided to pick up where I left off on my European tour. Monaco was the most boring place on earth. If I hadn't stumbled upon the poker game, I would have left a long time ago. This was not the first time I played poker with Europeans. The game was popular and cheating was rampant. This particular fixed game was a challenge. I wandered around it for several weeks, trying to understand how it was done. The game always had at least five players. Three were permanent and participated in the setups. The fourth was the target, always the rich, free-spirited player, and the fifth was someone like me, a conservative player included to make the game look good. A sixth or seventh player could have been added, but it was not necessary. The point is, these guys were good, they probably could have won fair, but this would require more time and effort. I focused on beating the cheaters. What else could I do these days? The victim of this evening was the German businessman Felix Gunther. He has already lost 200,000 euros. He was an affable guy and apparently quite wealthy, but even he was beginning to feel pain. I was down just under 20,000, but that was about to change. Are we still playing at table stakes? I asked. I find that when communicating with some Europeans, it is best to emphasize an American accent. They kind of expect it, and when you're going to trick a scammer, it's smart to give him what he expects. The game was simple. The deck we were playing with was missing a few cards. These cards were held by the player to the right of tonight's big winner, Stephen Doctor. The three sharks alternated who would win, but the course of the game was the same. Between each hand, they laid out a few cards and then stored them until needed. The dealer knew his name was Franco. If he had a last name, I never recognized it. The problem was that he had a real caffeine habit. Normally, like the rest of us, he took one toilet break every two hours. But today, we had a very attentive and stunningly attractive new waitress. Michelle was wearing an extravagantly short skirt and a blouse with too many buttons undone. I paid more attention to her than to the game, and she flirted back, making sure all the drink glasses were filled, including Franco's cup of coffee. When Franco needed a break, I innocently suggested that Michelle act as a dealer. The others chuckled, but did not object. Michelle wasn't just a sexy waitress, she was also an excellent mechanic. Only not cars, but cards, and it was not obvious, she had real skill. When I saw the flop include a king of spades and a queen of hearts followed by a seven of diamonds, I knew what was coming next. My friend across the table had a pair of kings, which his like-minded people slipped to him. He came in with a slight increase in the rate, and then I asked about the rates. This, monsieur, what's on the table? said Stephen. Good, because I'm all in, I said, pushing two stacks of bills that, if the top 20 euro bills were removed left 500 crisp 500 euro bills. I saw old Stephen blush, but how could he lose? He had three kings against a stupid American who spent most of the evening losing, looking at a pretty waitress. What's the matter? Should we start calling you Stephanie? I asked as offensively American as I could. Open up, my impudent friend. When I turned over my sevens to his kings, he was grinning widely. When the Jack of Diamonds came up, I thought he and his partners were enjoying themselves. When Franco walked into the room after the bathroom break, Michelle, the bitch that she was, smiled as the fourth seven came up, just in time. Oh, sorry, monsieur, she said as if showing sincere distress. Of course, the sharks suspected that they were being played, but how exactly remained a mystery. Well, my American friend, Gunther told me in the bar after the game ended, it was almost worth my 200,000 to see the look on Stephen's face. Then he added, 
You are a very lucky person. No, and here's your money back, I said. But I can't agree with this. You won them. No, I cheated like the others. The only honest person in the game was you. At that moment, Michelle appeared in a black dress that was so tight that it could be drawn on. I handed her a wad of euros that could strangle a goat. Mercy, any time you need a mechanic, she said and walked away. Gunther could hardly contain himself. But why, my friend? he asked. Actually, I have nothing else to do, I said. Gott, then you will go home with me and meet my family. They must return from my relatives. I can promise you the best schnitzel in Germany, he said. That's how I ended up in Stuttgart. Ollie Blackstone was a retired NYPD detective who just couldn't sit at home. They said he could find anyone. He did not always do this through legal means. Sorry, Maria, bad luck. I traced it to Catskills, but when I arrived, he was no longer there. Senator Ruiz knew Ollie since childhood. The short, fat black man who everyone underestimated was her old friend. It was he who got information about her ex and helped her get compensation, thanks to which she was able to enroll in law school. It's not your fault, Ollie, but you have absolutely no idea where he went. No, the guy clearly didn't run or hide. Part of the time, he was in the Western Catskills with a woman. She was German, looked very good, and was married. She was very friendly. But he is a shy type, although the locals considered him a fairly nice guy. Maria could only smile. David Landon is a pleasant rascal. How do you know that the woman was German and married? Most of the people in this part of the forest, and I mean the forests, are white. Many of them are Irish or German. I think they recognized their two and respected the wide gold ring she wore. Poor Ollie. What did they think of you? Well, Maria, with people like these, they may well consider themselves better than you, but they are too polite to let you know it. Ollie said, a smile lifting the corners of his mouth. So, we came empty-handed? Not really. I think I've identified his Achilles heel. His family is something else. First of all, I think he left because his wife was having an affair. The rest of the family play a little themselves. But your boy has never played. They consider him a humble, successful lawyer, but I am absolutely sure that he is from the Stuyvesant entity, in the full sense of the word. He is a fraud, no doubt, but a shrewd one, perhaps even a great one. He doesn't care about the law, but family is another matter. I think he will do anything to avoid them. How can I use this if we don't know where he is? I guarantee someone in this family knows. You just need to press the right button. He has another problem a property called 27 Division Street, the one he bought at the very beginning. This site is controlled by Center Square Development. The property itself is worth nothing, but he spent a fortune on it. He wasn't as careful as he should have been. Unlike his other deals, this one is directly related to the project. It is difficult to see any legitimate purpose in his actions. Good evening, Miss Gunther. I'm glad to meet you, I said in my pathetic German. Hello, Mr. Landon. I'm very glad to meet you, and your German is really terrible, Sophie Gunther said in perfect American English, struggling to suppress her laughter. Felix could tell me that his wife is American, I replied. Actually, I'm Canadian, and Felix always likes to prank North Americans this way. Sophie was at least 15 years younger than her husband. She was, as they say, a beauty. A short, but not petite woman. It was folded, round, in all the right places. I wondered why Felix was wandering around Monte Carlo alone when he was married to such a hot young wife. The couple had two children, a boy aged four and a girl aged two, and lived in a large house in the suburbs. When I say big, I mean, by European standards, about 10,000 square feet. The house had an addition, a large entertaining room with a bar, and ample outdoor space for dancing. Like many houses in Germany, it was ultra-modern and lacked the warmth of family. I missed that house in Catskills, but it was not difficult to stay with the Gunters. My hosts put me up in an extravagant guest room overlooking a nearby vineyard. They had a lot of fun, so having an extra man seemed just right for Sophie. 
She began to match me with all her available friends. The problem was what the hostess understood by freedom. Sophie, can I ask a question? I said, sitting with her at the small round table in the kitchen breakfast nook. Of course, Dave. I think I was paired with Mrs. Erickson at your dinner party last night. Yes. Were you against her as a partner? She's quite attractive and has a lively personality, she said. Well, she is married and, I believe, lives happily with her husband. But he wasn't with her last night, but I was. But she was just having a nice evening. She wouldn't seduce you when you first meet. She and her husband would have to come to an agreement before that would happen. But she wanted to meet you. You made a very good impression, and you have, I would say, an interesting reputation. She said all this, with a sly smile on her face. I hesitated before asking my next question, although by then I was already sure of what the answer would be. Mrs. Gunther, could you also, by chance, find mutual understanding with your husband? Why, Mr. Landon, what could have given you this impression? She said, her smile widening and a blush coloring her cheeks. At that moment, she was so clearly tugging at my chain that I had to laugh. So still? Well, as you already know, my family lives in Canada. Two big trips with children happen more than once every two years. So on these trips, when I supposedly visit them, I get to play, so to speak. I always choose a respectable man. Someone Felix doesn't know and hopefully never meets. Gambling is on his side. Thus, we indulge our vices within the limits of what is permitted. By the way, he loves to hear about my little adventures. She said this with slight embarrassment. Sometimes I feel like Alice walking through the looking glass. Left is right, and right has become wrong. My poor friend, it seems to me that you have a bad case of sanctimonious romanticism. What you need is to relax and enjoy life. After all, if a person violates some legal norms, then why does he not dare to violate social rules? She said. I don't judge. As you suggest, I'm hardly an angel. But accompanying married women makes me feel uneasy. Well, tonight, Fräulein Deiter, with whom you are paired, is not married, but unfortunately she is not free. So you have to behave well and just stay free. I invited her man, Rupert von Kabroith, and his wife, Annette. They have mutual understanding. He keeps a mistress or two, and she sometimes has a discreet affair, but only where no one finds out, Sophie told me. I see Mrs. Kubruth has relatives whom she also visits. No, she is a travel writer. When she is abroad, she plays, but only with men her husband will never meet. They are well off, but not rich. He is our version of the Count. I'm impressed, but I'm strictly speaking the odd man out tonight, I said. Yes, be a good boy. Don't show your blues from the outback, she said, patting my hand. The evening began with cocktails shortly before eight. Dinner was supposed to take place at nine, but they rarely ate until late. Most evenings lasted until midnight. All the guests that evening, like my host, were selling auto parts. Good evening, Herr Landon. I've heard a lot of good things about you, Annette said. I'm very glad to meet you, Countess, I replied. What the hell are you doing here, David? Same as you, pretending we never met. Fräulein Deiter was quite pretty. She was a tall brunette with exceptionally developed breasts, young, maybe around 20 years old. She spoke almost no English and, as stated in my German, you could get a glass of wine or coffee, but nothing more. Most of the guests spoke English, so I communicated well until Sophie cornered me around midnight. She pulled me onto the steps in the garden, away from the other guests. Why didn't you tell me that you slept with Annette von Kabruth? She asked, not too pleased. Why on earth did you say that? You've been avoiding each other all evening, and you're just her type. Sorry, I didn't think it was visible, I said. Do you realize how impolite it is to embarrass poor Rupert like that? I'll have to ask Felix to apologize. She then turned to return to her guests, leaving me alone to go into the garden. Ornamental trees, shrubs, and paths were illuminated with hidden lighting fixtures with architectural precision. A voice came from the shadows. 
The most pleasant evening for the end of October, but I'm afraid we won't have those again, said Rupert von Kabroth. You may be right, but I assure you that where I come from, in New York, it is much colder, I said. It's strange, my wife was talking about the heat. Well, here's your problem, hot summer and cold winter. Well then, I'll try not to go there. He came out of the shadows. You know, he began, I think I look better and a little younger than you, but of course you are still taller, richer, and much more interesting. I don't think I can be called interesting. This is a false conceit, because you are very dangerous, and this always excites women. Perhaps you misjudged me, I said. I think not, at least in my wife's mind. Perhaps you are assessing her incorrectly. Oh, I didn't talk about her intentions, only her desires. But it's time for me to go back. Good evening, Graf. Hope to see you again. Good evening, Herr Landon, and I wish you to return home soon. With these words, the Count left. Thank you for having me, Mr. Boswell, said Liz Parker, the bank's newly appointed executive vice president, Chamon. I hope that I am and will always be available to both our clients and the community, Larry Boswell Jr. said, motioning for Liz to sit down. Senator Ruiz sends his regards to you. Well, how can I help the senator? Liz actually hated what she was about to do. Larry Boswell was a good guy, although if it weren't for his family's money, he would have been a good guy. She did not envy his wealth or his position. It was a classic case of money doesn't solve problems. Anne Boswell, Larry's wife, was, as Liz discovered, out and about. She barely tried to hide her adventurers. The other woman and men in his family were hardly better, although more secretive. State Shamontov was built on theft and corruption. Larry Sr. was an old and great swindler. The Center Square project was replete with what politicians called honest extortions. Once Center Square was completed, most of the project's contributors would have become lifers or at least until the next election and another turn to the trough that is Albany. Larry Jr., as Liz found out, was not involved in anything and disputed everything. He had gone to marriage counseling twice with his wife and was planning to go back again because Anne was pregnant and there was little chance that this, her second child, was a blood relative of her husband. This was Anne's fifth pregnancy. Liz realized that she was looking out of the office window at the center chamon, which will soon be raised to the ground. Sighing and straightening her shoulders, she dropped the bomb. This is a subpoena for your appearance before the State Senate Standards and Practices Subcommittee. This is a relatively new group, and we are investigating allegations of improper activity under the state's eminent domain process, Liz said, handing the paper to Larry. But I don't know anything about eminent domain. I assure you I have nothing to do with the Center Square project. Oh, we know that, but you know the whereabouts of David Landon, your brother-in-law and closest friend? David knows it all, chapter to verse. He's a true expert on corruption related to eminent domain, and we have him at gunpoint, she said, pulling out a large document from her briefcase. Liz smiled as she handed Larry a photocopy of the deed to 27 Division Street. The ancient building was in complete disrepair and needed demolition. Stuyvesant, LTD, kept it for three years and then in the last year completely restored it to its 1857 condition. Long before the central plaza was announced and before anyone but a select few insiders knew about it, Stuyvesant was the owner. The piece of land described in the agreement was critical to the project, the only thing Liz and the senator couldn't figure out was how Landon was going to make a profit. He paid $5,000 for the building, which was all it was worth. The property taxes that were due when Stuyvesant bought it were over $90,000. Landon paid those taxes and saved the building from demolition, and then invested heavily in restoring the building to its archic condition. When the building is taken away by right of exclusive ownership, which is what will happen, he, at best, will get 5000 back. Landon will lose all taxes paid and all costs of repairing and restoring the building. It seemed like a stupid move, but Landon was far from stupid. 
Ollie used some contacts to try to find Landon in Europe where they thought he should be. Surprisingly, some Interpol employees have heard of the lawyer. In modern times, he was a card sharper, known to participate in fraudulent games, although the details were vague and his whereabouts unknown. But he's a gambler and a sharpie, said the interlocutors. Look, Dave is not what you think. He has had problems in his marriage and is a hopeless romantic. He couldn't face the truth and ran away. Mr. Boswell, the document you are holding shows that Dave purchased a key property in his corporate name long before the development became public knowledge. As Liz spoke, Larry looked down and saw the names on the document. He threw it like it was on fire. Then he stood up abruptly and turned his back to her to look out the window. His head hung down and he muttered, Stuyvesant, does this name mean something to you? She asked. Still looking out the window, he said, I take it you've never heard of Peter Stuyvesant, colonial governor of New York, she said. That's not true. Peter Stuyvesant was the last Dutch governor of New Amsterdam. He was forced to surrender the colony to the British, and it became New York. He made the best possible deal for the inhabitants of the colony with the new sovereign. People retained their religion and their betrayal. Looks like I still don't understand. It's a joke turned inside out, just Dave's style. The sovereign state of New York is taking the people's property, and he and Stuyvesant are fighting back. So you believe me now? He's a good person. Please! He just left, because his wife is just as wild as yours. He turned to look at her as she spoke. Sorry, I didn't mean to say, you know about Anne, he said, looking defeated and tired. Please, I'm so sorry, she said. Larry sat back. What do you want? All he has to do is come and testify. We will give him limited immunity. He will pay damages and perhaps make some kind of deal with federal prosecutors. But he shouldn't get a serious sentence. Maybe a two-year trip to Ray Brook. He plays tennis? She said, forcing herself to smile. What if he doesn't come back? It will be very awkward for families. Many people could get hurt. Your relatives are not exactly saints. And of course, there is Anne. We wouldn't want to use this. But the senator will want it. Liz couldn't answer. Politics is a dirty game. Okay, I'll talk to the family and then to David. He is a good man. I doubt he'll throw them all under the bus to save himself. She stood up to leave, but she couldn't just leave. She had to explain herself. The senator is trying to change the system to help many people who cannot protect themselves. Please try to understand, if only there was another way. Sometimes you have to do terrible things to do good, she said. You talk like a woman, he said. It's unfair. If I had time, I would tell you what a man once did to me. So believe me, I have no sympathy for your wife or Mrs. Landon. Are we going to compare wounds now? Well, think about this. We don't even know the father's race. There seem to be several possibilities. Liz said nothing and hurried away, but what she really wanted to do was run to Lawrence Boswell, hug him, and comfort one of the few truly good men she knew. They gathered in Agnes Langdon's kitchen, a large farmhouse-style room that Agnes had recently remodeled. They lined one side of a long table, in the style of shaker reproductions. Agnes was in the center, Doris Landon to the right, Larry's mom, Margaret, to her left, and the twins brought up the rear of the group. Larry didn't invite the men. They have no power in this matter, he thought, and will only confuse all matters. I have to tell you something, he began. Does this concern David? Asked Doris. Larry felt her pain. He knew she was suffering, and not for the first time, he wondered how his sister could bear the pain her actions caused. Yes. Today a woman named Elizabeth Parker came to see me. She is Senator Ruiz's assistant. They're looking for David, Larry said. Did you tell her that we did too? Asked Agnes. No, because I know where Dave is. I didn't tell you because I wanted to keep in touch with him, and if I betrayed his trust, he would have cut me off too. You could have at least told us how he's doing, Larry's mom said. No, he was right. It's more important that someone knows in case David needs something, Doris said. Okay, what is the problem, and what does this senator want? Asked Agnes. Well, David has been speculating with confiscated properties, and I'm afraid it's time to pay up. What does it mean? 
asked Agnes. Larry explained. I checked out this Stuyvesant company this afternoon. Her land purchase seemed suspicious. But why did suspicion fall on David? asked Doris. Because he left here with nothing and doesn't seem to need the money. Add to that the obvious pun in the company's name, and it brings to mind David and some less than noble deeds. I don't believe my son could do anything wrong, Agnes said. I'm not accusing him of wrongdoing, but you have to admit that the circumstances are suspicious. We need to talk to him, Doris said. I'll call him as soon as we're done, Larry said. I need to talk to my son, Agnes demanded. He won't want to talk to you directly, and if we try, he'll cut me off too. At least if I do the talking, we'll know where he is and that he's okay, Larry said. He tried to convince these dominant women that the man they had always forced to do what they wanted would no longer listen to them. Can you at least tell him that I love him? asked Doris. Yes, and tell him that we miss him and that he should come home, echoed the twins. Look, I told him this from the very beginning, but the question now is these accusations. If he returns home, he could go to jail. He's a lawyer. He knows that. So what should I ask him to do? said Larry. Tell him that I will support him no matter what. If he doesn't come home to help us get through this, I'll understand. But if he comes, I will never leave him, no matter what he does or what happens, Doris said, trying not to break down. Tell my son that we forgive him, and as Doris said, whatever he wants, Agnes said. That's right, even if it takes every penny we have to help him out, Larry's mother said. All the women started crying. Larry realized what he had to do, and it was a lie because he knew what Dave wanted, and it was an apology. He wanted them to ask for his forgiveness and promise to leave him alone. The problem was that they didn't think their actions were truly wrong and couldn't imagine letting him go. Larry didn't think they were capable of letting David go, and unfortunately, David knew it. But hey, what are good friends for? if not to tell you what you want to hear. Very impressive, Felix, I said. We walked through the Stuttgart factory motor vehicle parts. My friend and host for the last six weeks, Felix, was the president and major shareholder of an auto parts manufacturer. I was hoping you'd be impressed, Felix said. What can I say about this? It's so efficient and clean here. I didn't expect that the factory could be so clean. What did you expect grease everywhere? he said, patting me on the back. My instinct told me that the invitation to the plant had a specific purpose. Call it being a lawyer for too long, but Felix wanted something. He and his wife, Sophia, were always cheerful, but the last few weeks I felt like I was being viewed as a potential bride. At one dinner after another, the same group of auto parts manufacturers attended. They seemed to want to know everything, from what I ate for breakfast to how I slept at night. Felix led me out of the production area and into a much smaller office building. All four buildings on the three-acre site had a utilitarian appearance. The administrative building was two-story. The sales department was located on the first floor, and the accounting department and executive offices were on the second floor. Felix took me through the engineering and storage areas and finally into the production areas. He was an excellent tour guide but the tour was clearly over when he led me into his office. His brother Hans, Wilhelm Jenner, and Ulrich Franks were waiting for us there. The last two were technically the CEOs of two of his competitors, but competition was the last thing these guys wanted. Ulrich was about 40 years old, his friends called him Rick, and he had just taken over his small company from his father. Willy Jenner was from East Germany. He was about 60 but looked hardly 50. He was an old wise fox with a very dubious reputation. Guten Tag, gentlemen, I said. In response, I received, Hello, Dave. Felix's administrative assistant served us coffee, and we continued chatting about nothing in particular for about 15 minutes, until, on a signal that I had not noticed, Felix brought up the topic for which I had been brought. Dave, we were interested to know your opinion, Felix began, but hesitated. We ask you to express your opinion on the possible expansion of our activities in the North American market, said Rick. He was not a patient man. 
Well, I believe that you are already in this market. After all, German cars use proprietary parts and tools, different parts and equipment for each brand, I said. True in principle, but we need a common after-sales market, said Hans. Well, why ask me? I'm, of course, not an expert in your business. But you know the local situation, Felix said. I understand that when we say North America, we don't mean Mexico. It's too dangerous. And Canada. Wages are rising. Unions are somewhat strong. And the currency is strengthening. No, we mean the U.S., where wages are falling, unions are weak, and most importantly, an attractive, corrupt government. So any states, specifically, we were thinking about North Carolina or New York, Rick said. I see. But why New York? Outside New York, there is high unemployment, no corporate taxes, and very soon cheap natural gas, Felix told me. It's clear. Well, good luck to you then, I said. You don't understand, Mr. Landon. We need someone familiar with local customs, Hans said. Such as, well, you know, rewards and the like, Felix explained. I see you are looking for a person who would deal with honest offerings, as we call it. Exactly. We're looking for a middleman of sorts, Rick said. We consider you a suitable candidate, Felix said. Why? Well, your experience, said Felix. Felix, are you saying that I am a swindler and a swindler? I asked. Yes, that's why we need you, said Vil, speaking for the first time. To put our cards on the table, we need someone who gets their hands dirty and knows the system. But someone we trust. We trust David Landon. It might be better not to play poker with him, but he won't cheat his friends. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your high opinion of me, but for some reason it seems to me that this is not the whole group. It is obvious that we are a delegation to determine interests and to, well, determine the scope of any problems, Felix said. Issue? We're looking into your possible legal difficulties, Rick said. The night before, my brother-in-law called it and said that the legislative comedy was hunting me. Some state senator threatened to make the family hostage if I showed up. Let me assure you, gentlemen, that I will handle any legal difficulties that arise. However, I still have a few family issues to resolve. Women can make a man wish he was in jail. My last remark was met with appropriate good humor, after which they turned the matter over to Wilhelm for him to make the actual proposal. It wasn't a bad deal. I would still be a crook but the kind of respectable corporate type that was considered acceptable in American society. I was only 46. I had enough time to start a new life and career, and here they offer me this. Of course, I have to think about your proposal, but I need time to think. I also need to return home to solve my family problems. Of course we understand, but we need an answer before the new year, Felix said to General Agreement. I will give you my answer before Christmas, I said. Very good, said Will. He was clearly the leader, and I wondered why he chose me. Larry's call the evening before the meeting in Stuttgart shocked me. Larry won't be able to resist. These women will keep screwing him until he gives them everything they want. I didn't believe for a minute that they really repented. However, I knew that they truly loved and cared about me. It would be so easy if I could hate them. But how can I do that? What bothered me most was the fact that they were now seeing the tip of the iceberg of my nefarious deeds. Doris and my mother were especially formidable, and Boswell's mother had a fortune behind her. They would untangle me as easily as the string on a child's kite. I didn't even want to think about how they could use my daughters against me. You will never stop being a father, no matter how hard you try. My first step was leaving Germany. I still had to get home. I booked a plane ticket to Amsterdam. There I made a two-day layover to organize my response to the good Senator Ruiz. Another woman God has cursed me with. I was beginning to wonder if the divine had a liking for men in general, or if I was a special case. There was a knock on the door while I was waiting for an answer from Albany. She entered immediately without saying a word. She started undressing as if we were an old married couple and this was our shared hotel room. 
Can you tell me how you found me, Annette? Sophia's tapping the Gunther family's home phones, as well as their mobile phones. Felix is not allowed to play on the side. She's as jealous as you come promiscuous. But she's right. Like most men in these relationships, he's an easy target. If you don't protect your man, you will lose him. It's clear. She heard me book the tickets and called you. But what did you say to the family? As soon as you left, Rupert left with his new woman. I think you've met her. The children are now at Euro Disney with their grandmother. I was not specifically invited, so I'm here at your disposal. When does your flight leave? The day after tomorrow at 4 a.m., I said. Gut, she said. We made love. Just before the hotel kitchen closed, I ordered food and two bottles of white German wine. So why did you cry during almost the entirety of our lovemaking? Because I love you, fucking man, she said. Is this all we can have? Sex? What else could we have? Living together. We are both married. For spouses, traitors. I have children who need me, and Rupert says that you will accept Wilhelm's offer and return to America permanently. So your husband is involved in this? Did he tell you why Wilhelm chose me? They say that you are one of those swindlers who will never betray their friends. Jenner is the same. He's from East Berlin. He left the black market when the wall came down. You are his type of man. Your husband must be too. Doesn't he work for Jenner? Yes. But this is purely a family matter, and my father makes sure that my husband's hands remain clean. Rupert is not as experienced a professional con artist as you are, she said. And your husband? What does he think about my new job? He's afraid that I might leave him for you, so he's glad you're leaving. So you came for the last one? I came to say that I love you, and you must return home to your beloved wife and forgive her for what she was stupid. We women can be so stupid to men, but a good husband should be understanding and forgiving. Otherwise, he is not a real man at all. She said this with a sincerity that struck me to the core. Annette was a special woman. We kissed. I didn't know how I could leave her, but I knew that she would never leave her husband and children. He can sleep with any woman in Germany, and she will never leave. The most she could do was sleep with other men to restore her pride. We were a hopeless couple. Two romantics stuck in marriages with practical spouses. Annette and I told ourselves that we too could be practical. But it came at a cost. She was right about one thing. My always practical wife allowed herself to be stupid because she wanted another man. Did she regret it? Will we ever be able to have an equal marriage, honest relationship? So many questions, and I had no answers. I don't remember anything about Amsterdam except the airport, the hotel room, and Annette. Her last words to me were, Go home to your wife, but remember that I love you, and I don't give up what I love. A Christmas tree was erected in Rockefeller Center. It's that time of year in New York City when people experience the stress that comes from trying to be cheerful. The Dutch flight attendants recommended the Club Suites Hotel where they were staying in New York. Its rooms are small, but it's across the street from Rockefeller Center, making it a convenient location to get in and out of. I've been told that more people get engaged and more marriages break up in December than any other month. I thought about ending my marriage on the 1st of January last year, but here we are, I'm still married. For Doris, divorce would be easy if she wanted it. If not, I'll need a lawyer, and a good lawyer. My finances have been pretty tight. It would be embarrassing if my wealth became known. I didn't want any publicity that might offend my new German partners. Oh yes, I accepted their offer. Why not? Free enterprise is the American way. And what could be more enterprising than being a messenger boy for a group of German industrialists? Jimmy Landrew was very happy to hear from me. He seemed to miss me, as did his creditors. He was more than happy with my new position, as were many of his friends. It's amazing how many wonderful and expensive restaurants there are in New York, with very dark corners. I think that in one week I justified Wilhelm's faith in my abilities. I sent him a simple email. Ready? We can start. Good, Wilhelm Jenner. He was a careful man, and I like careful men. Jimmy had some doubts. 
This standards committee is not the Moreland Commission. The governor won't step in to save you, Landrew said. Don't worry, Jim, I won't point fingers at you. Besides, the only thing they have that directly links me to any property that is being foreclosed on is 27 Division Saint. You didn't give it to me. Division Street is my ace at the bottom of the pack, I said. I will never understand you. How do you manage to stay calm? These people want to wiretap you. Never bluff when the deck is stacked, was all I answered, leaving Jimmy shaking his head and worrying. That evening I returned from yet another expensive dinner with the assistant of someone whose sole job was to negotiate insurance, banking, and legal work. Everything is very legal, without the actual transfer of money, and without any real connection between the parties. Sure, there were jimmies in the world who needed loans, but they were small fish who knew who, where, when, what, and why. The money was for information and to protect my back. Vaccination is built into the deals. The financial insurance and legal work looked legitimate, and it was all pay to play. There was a knock on the door as I threw my expensive jacket onto the chair next to the small table. When I opened the door, she came in and began to undress. I was overcome with deja vu. What are you doing here, Doris? You didn't come to me, so I had to come to you. How did you find me? A little bird told me. On or off, she said. What? Should I leave the stockings on or take them off? Stop it. Sorry, I cannot. I need my man. A year has passed. I need my Davy. What happened to Mark? By this time, she was completely undressed and moving towards the bed. He's gone, poor thing. His contract was not renewed. Did you fire him? No, his contract was not renewed. Are you the head of the department? No, only since January. Come on, I need this. It will not happen. Yes, it will happen. Maybe just once, as you say. Did you fire that bastard? The outgoing manager fired. He loved to seduce other people's wives. He didn't want such a person in my department. You just sleep with them. Shut up and do it. After that, we lay together. I had forgotten how good it was to be with her. No woman could do to me what Doris could do. Only Annette was her rival. I saw that these women, completely different from each other and from completely different walks of life, were made of the same flesh. They loved sex but needed love. They wanted to possess their men but remain aloof. They could be depressingly practical, but they craved romance. And yet they always made a rational decision, a safe and selfish choice with the excuse that it is the only practical way. My problem was that I was helpless when it came to them. This won't work, I said. And why? Skinny German bitch is much better? She's not the problem. The problem is your lies and betrayal. You are a hypocrite. I didn't lie. I did everything except not send you a photo. As for lying, you did it throughout our entire 20-year marriage. What a fool I was to believe in this charity with poor innocent Davi. I admit that I may have hidden some things, I said. You are a deceiver and a swindler. Obviously insightful, but that doesn't change anything. I was tormented by guilt when I first heard the truth. I blamed myself. But then, Annette told me the whole truth. You just are who you are. I had no choice. I had to support my family. My family has money. Do you think I wanted them to support us? Ha! Here it is, pride. You are proud of what you did. It's a shame you can't tell people about this. That doesn't justify what you did. No, it justifies. Because at first you were deceived. You hid who you are. I only received part of what I was entitled to. Come home, she said. I promise to be good. No. Yes. Maybe. So why did Annette tell you where to find me? I asked. She said that we should be together. That you love me. Has it ever occurred to you that she has her own selfish reasons for us getting back together? Of course I'm not stupid. She thinks she can see you on the side. She thinks we will come to some kind of agreement. I'm not interested. Me too. Mark and everything else is behind us. I learned my lesson, she said. Nonsense. You've already made some kind of deal with Annette. 
Do you really think that I would trade one cheating wife for two cheating wives? For a man who is facing prison, you are a terrible prude, she said. David, why are you smiling? She asked. The driver picked me up in front of the hotel. The taxi driver wasn't interested in going to the South Bronx until I showed him five crisp $100 bills. The fare is plus 200 there and plus 300 back. No more than an hour, I told the rather surprised Sikh taxi driver. When we arrived, it was a storefront in a nice-looking block of buildings. Unfortunately, most of the shops were empty, and there was a vacant lot across the street. The taxi was waiting for me right outside the entrance in a spot clearly marked as no parking. Senator Ruiz's district office made no impression. The reception I received was hostile at best. The secretary was sitting at a simple office desk. She was a young black woman who obviously took an immediate dislike to my hand-sewn European suit. I hope it was the suit and not the color of my skin, but you just don't know. Two young Spanish-speaking men sat at a card table, working on books that looked like voter registration books. They stood up when I entered as if I had come to challenge them to a duel. Is Senator Ruiz free? I asked. Do you have an appointment? Asked the young woman. No, but I'm sure she'll want to see me. You need a meeting. Are you a voter? She said, unable to keep the grin out of her voice. Just tell her David Landon is here, and we'll see what she says. I guess I said it confidently enough to make her doubt it. Wait here, I'll tell her. With these words, she stood up and headed towards the back offices. The boys approached menacingly, but I just looked at them. A short, plump woman approached me, extending her hand. Mr. Landon, I'm very glad to meet you, said the woman whom I took to be a senator. The senator was followed by the secretary who now looked like a sheep. The senator offered coffee, which I declined, and then led me back to her rather modest office. I have to say, David, you are not what I expected, said Senator Ruiz. Oh, what did you expect, a gray-haired, obese, middle-aged family man? You are about a year late. It's clear. Well, let's discuss eminent domain in general or Stuyvesan in particular. Neither one nor the other. I don't have time for that. If you need advice on foreclosure law, I can refer you to some excellent attorneys. As far as Stuyvesant is concerned, my client matters are confidential. Well, I have a subpoena that will check this. Save your strength. The chairman of your committee canceled your subpoena yesterday. Obviously, this was not news to her, but she did not expect that I would find out about it so soon. You are well informed. You should be aware of my work. And what is your profession? Lawyer, previously dealt with issues of allocation of land plots, and now with corporate issues. I'm still keeping you on the purchase of 27 Division Street. If we reveal this, it will end up in the Chamon papers. Oh, I expect it. In fact, I'm counting on it. Let me ask, where were you born and raised? Of course here. This is my house, she said, waving her hand towards the window. Well, I was born in Chamonix. My grandfather took me to Broadway for ice cream until he died, and my mother took me to Main Street to shop. Do you think I want a Chamon finish the same way? I said, waving my hand towards the same window. From my pocket, I took out an envelope with a letter. It was delivered to me by express mail that morning. What is this? She asked when I handed her the letter. Read it, I said, turning to the door. The letter was written on the governor's official letterhead, very formally thanking me for donating 27 Division Street to the state of New York. It contained very extensive research, confirming what my grandfather had told me many years ago. Division 27 Street was a building for secrets. It housed bootleggers in the 20th century, and more importantly for my purposes, runaway slaves in the mid-19th century. But I don't understand, she said. What's incomprehensible here? The only subject from whom the government cannot take away property is itself. Building on Division Street in Chamonix was donated to the citizens of the state. They graciously accepted the donation of the Underground Railroad Station, which is now part of the state's historic trails and attractions. The building is in its original condition, with hiding places and secret entrances. So you gave away the building. You are still a deceiver and a fraud. But too smart for you and those who want to destroy my house for the sake of some kind of profit.
Without 27 Division Street, there will be a big hole in the center of the Center Square development project. They will have to redo and reapprove the project. It will take years to return. Good afternoon, Senator. The Senator could only look at the documents and shake her head. There was more here than met the eye. There was more to this man than you expected. He was no saint, but he certainly wasn't a villain either. The Bush Memorial Chapel at Russell Sage University is a large neoclassical building. Today it is filled to capacity. Wilhelm Jenner was pleased to see that many family members Chamont decided to attend this event. He was told that it would be a small, quiet wedding. But the hall was filled with representatives of the various branches of the Chamont family and their German guests, including his daughter, Countess von Kabroth. The bride looked beautiful in her simple white dress. She was several years younger than the groom. He had been married before. This caused a small scandal and the fact that he, a Catholic, did not marry in his church. This was the bride's first marriage, and she was very much in love. The only witness was the bridesmaid, a short, plump woman of Hispanic origin. The best man was completely different. Tall, expensively dressed, he had the appearance of a lawyer and outshone the groom in appearance. But no one doubted the superior character of the groom, Lawrence Boswell Jr., the new president and chief executive officer of Chamont Bank and Trust, or the virginal beauty of his bride, Elizabeth Parker. No one in the room could say the same about the best man, David Landone, and his wife. Wilhelm Jenner, who was sitting in the hall, was glad to have the opportunity to communicate with his new colleagues from Chaumont. When David offered to buy the bank after the failure of the Center Square development project, Wilhelm was not sure, but everything ended well. Now they built their facilities with other people's money and with the active support of the government. David was the right choice. He was corrupt enough to pull off the necessary deals. He first came to Wilhelm's attention when Annette went to America with him. Wilhelm investigated and liked what he found. Annette's husband gave her respectability, just as William's father-in-law had predicted. Unfortunately, Rupert was practically useless when it came to their business. They were small fish, and the big ones were always trying to swallow them. Landon arranged everything well. The state gave them cheap land, exempted them from all taxes, and subsidized the training of workers. There will be cheap electricity when the state lifts its moratorium on fracking, which Landon said will come when gas prices rise. Today's wedding neutralized one of their problems, the good Senator Ruiz. Landon had her wrapped around his little finger with this historic building scam. Yenner didn't believe for a second that Landon hadn't originally planned to use the Square Center scheme to blackmail him with that building. This was the kind of ploy that Wilhelm himself would have used. Wilhelm Jenner has come a long way since the days when he sold pirated rock and roll records on the streets of East Berlin. He didn't look his 67 years old, and today he felt young. Why? The night before, he put two women to bed, the groom's mother and the best man's mother. They came to his room to ask his intercession for poor good-for-nothing David, as Agnes described him. But how can I help? This is, of course, your family problem, he said. He respects you, Mr. Yenner. Make him listen to reason, Margaret pleaded. Call me Vil, please. Ladies, may I offer you something to drink while we discuss this? He didn't tell them that he had already obliged David to stop acting like a child and make peace with his wife. That way he and Annette could be safe. He even promised to send her to him often, supposedly on business. This last promise was negotiated by Annette in exchange for help in reconciling the Landons. She had to play the trump card, but the fact that Rupert's mistress became pregnant freed Annette to make this move. The ceremony ended and the wedding party headed to the Victorian mansion along Washington Park that became David Landon's new home, a large house in the Victorian neighborhood, a house that could accommodate the whole family and numerous guests. David, can I talk to you? Agnes asked Landon. Yes, Mom. I want you to know that I... I know you never meant to hurt me. You had my best interests at heart. Of course, it's not your fault that everything was... Well, not quite as it seemed. I love you and will always love you. No matter what, you are my son. I've done some things I'm not proud of, but... 
Life is not a bowl of cherries, David said, a smile breaking his usually gloomy face. I told you this once, isn't it? Smile and everything will always work out. Be happy, you only live once. And are you happy? David thought about this as he looked across the small garden in which they stood to where his wife, Doris, was talking to his mistress, Annette. Both women were laughing and having fun. At this moment, Annette turned to him. She smiled and brought her hand to her stomach. She wore an empire waist dress that was shorter in the front than in the back. It was a very elegant dress, befitting a countess and concealing her growing figure. She removed her hand and turned back to Doris. Of course, why not be happy? We only live once, he said, hugging his mother. Oh, I'm so glad. Life is so difficult that we needed to save our family. Wilhelm said this just last night. He is a wise and understanding person. The Countess is very lucky to have him as her father. Yes, Mom, I'm happy, and I learned my lesson. From now on, I will be a good boy. Never bet on the deck, no matter how handsome the dealer is, he said. Agnes was puzzled by the last statement, following his gaze across to where Doris stood next to Annette Mullane, Countess von Kabreuth, the daughter of her last lover, who hoped that his daughter's pregnancy would give him the grandson he longed for. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.